the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people were evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos and articles and images. We spend a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live. It's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story. They were helping their neighbor. If a family was being evacuated, a group would just jump in and help out. So it was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Hello everyone, I'm geologist Philip Ong, here with Mr. Mr. Dan Dupont of HawaiiTracker.com, bringing you guys another Kilauea and a little bit of Mauna Loa volcano update today, Thursday, September 2nd, 2021. We've had two intrusion pulses on Kilauea uh, appear to be complete now at this point, and we have some follow-up data we can share with you guys, so we're going to go through what's happening right now with the volcano first. Uh, we will collect some questions, Dan will collect some questions in the chat and man our stream, so let him know if you have any issues with our audio or video or anything like that. Um, we may be having an issue on Facebook today, so if that's the case, uh, um, hope you guys can find us over on YouTube or, or elsewhere. Um, so we'll, we'll uh, let us know if you have any issues here, and we will uh, collect questions, discuss some, some live viewer questions, and then we'll look at a little bit of the history of the earthquake sequences of past intrusions in this area um, and and some of the other research that's been put out. So we're, we're going to go back just a little ways. We're not going to quite get to 1974, maybe at the very, very end. We'll touch on it a little bit and leave the 74 eruption itself for a future future time, perhaps next week. Um, but uh, there's a lot to talk about uh, of other intrusions in 2015 and 2006 and 1982 and 1981 and so on, uh, that, that give us some context of what's happening now. So that's our, our menu today. Uh, start us off by looking at Kilauea here and some of the what's happening right now. We'll cut across several of the different monitoring techniques here. And this is a, a 
INSAR uh, satellite uh, radar interferometry image. Essentially what they're doing here, if you've never seen this kind of image before, is the satellite will come and do one pass over the Earth and collect elevation data with the radar. And then it come back, comes back and does it again after a certain interval of time. Right? And so if I scroll this image down here, you'll see here it says at the top, this is from August 19th, September 1st, 2021. So that's our window of time, the two passes of the satellite that shut down the radar. And in between, it collected elevation data and it subtracted those data sets from each other. And so what you're seeing here is that the residual, the difference, what changed between those times. And it's a pretty psychedelic pattern here, which is if you're not used to seeing the, an INSAR image here. And uh, there are other ways to display this, and I'm sure we'll see those in the future. This is one of the, the more raw um, ways the data comes in. So um, what you're seeing here is a, a single uh, center of, of inflation, apparently, with a deformation extending outwards from there and all the way around. You can see by, by, the, by the bullseye pattern here. And we'll leave it at that for now. We'll talk about the insert a little bit more later, just to show you guys that that is something that's, that is being used. The satellites coming in, flying, and shooting, shooting the, the radar down. Of course, satellites are used for other things as well. So we will transition here and show you guys uh, some of the uh, other uses, like the GPS. But first, I just want to touch base and just show you guys first the most current update from the USGS here, which was issued for the week this past Tuesday here. And the volcano is not erupting. Um, there are no, uh, there's no threat to any people or populated areas. That's important to keep saying here. When people see that there's uh, an uptick in activity, that might be a concern. But there is really no concern, concern from any any of the data here that we're seeing. This is more for scientific curiosity and interest. And you know, in fact, what's kind of nice is if the volcano has opened up some some place for the magma to go that's not anywhere down the East Rift. It's like it's it's adding capacity where it can go go besides where, where people are. So that's great. So that's just a, it's, it's a net gain in that sense. Um, in any case, earthquake rates have decreased in, a, uh, in the past 24 hours up to Tuesday. Uh, other monitoring streams, including sulfur dioxide emission rates and webcam views, do not show changes. They say they were down to 33 earthquakes in 24 hours, um, and deformation ceased approximately noon on August 30th. These observations suggest that new magma supply to the intrusion below the surface south of Kilauea's summit caldera has slowed or stopped. And so that's 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 most of it there. It talks about low SO2 rates some more, 45 tons per day. It talks about uh, no changes at the Halimau Lava Lake and no unusual activity on the East Rift Zone there um, as well. So uh, that's that's the basics of the update. So that's where everything is coming from. We're going to elaborate more than that, that, that text update here. And so here's an example of what else the satellite's doing. It's shooting down to this GPS. And this is a, a new deployment by the USGS who went out there. This picture goes back to uh, August 25th. So this is two days into the week-long event. So they probably got a good chunk of data. And they went and established uh, these GPS units with solar panels and batteries to collect data 24-7 over these established benchmarks, which are used in other surveys, uh, uh, perhaps yearly, you know, we talked about some of the GPS surveys recently. And let's see what the caption else, uh, what else it says here. Um, permission and coordination with Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, an area that's close to the public. And so you can see that it's set up to measure vertical and horizontal ground motion during the intrusion last week. That's basically it, the GPS station. You can see Mauna Loa here in the background rising up the northeast flank of Mauna Loa. Then we have a second temporary GPS picture, and here it is put out uh, in that desert area. You can see a lot of this tephra from the, the explosive uh, eruptions of Kilauea most recently in 1790. I left all this gravelly deposit on the ground everywhere. Maybe we can zoom in so you can see a little better there. You can see the benchmark cemented in here into the lava rock, right? This lava bedrock, and then you see all this gravel that's covering it on top. So there's a little extra geology in there. Solar panel, batteries, all that, and uh, just to make sure you see that this is where it came from, this USGS caption, temporary GPS sites deployed at Kilauea Summit, Wednesday, August 25th, uh, little by S. Conway. And you can see they talk about a tripod and attached GPS antenna centered over the benchmark and collected for vertical and horizontal ground motion. All right, so that's, that's the... The, the satellite use there, we have instruments in the ground, um, we being the general public and in particular the USGS, of which we are not a part. 
just reading their data here and thankful to, for the, to them to have all this data here. And here's the Sand Hill Station tilt meter, one of the instruments in the ground showing a pretty big range of change in micro radians. And this is what we've been looking at for the past, oh, for a while now, the past couple weeks here, or a week and a half or so since we were, were tuned into to this very localized uh, uh, signal. It's mostly on this station, not so much at the Summit Halle Mau Mau signal. So we'll, we'll discuss some of the, the specifics a little later. We talked about the different components before and a different different signals might have been. Like the first pulse of change right here, the second pulse of change right here. right? And really the point, I want to zoom in at the end here, what's going on right now is that um, uh, the component to the southeast is showing essentially stable. So not a whole lot of change consistent with the USGS's most recent report. On Tuesday, that magma is not, no longer feeding that intrusion. But we are seeing to the north on this northeast component uh, a, a resumption of inflation post of this event. So the interesting thing, of course, is this northeast direction could have been that shallower part of this recent intrusion. Um, but beyond that is that shallower Hale Ma'u Ma'u magma reservoir and network. So it could be that this is measuring that same direction, but a slightly further source that's now resuming post all this intrusion activity uh, in the southern part of the caldera, perhaps resuming back towards the, the, the previous trend of inflation um, in that shallower source there. Okay, so that's, that's the tilt. Um, we'll come back to tilt in more detail as well, but I want to kind of go through everything a little bit quickly just so we can cover the bases and uh, progressively peel off some layers and go into more detail here. So this is a, the, the most recent earthquakes. So I have it set here, the last one day, all magnitudes. And you can see just in the last day, there haven't been that many, one, two, three, four, five, six different earthquakes here. And four in the area of recent activity, one upper east rift slash east rift connector, and then one south flank. So very minor activity there. I can maybe zoom it out. You might see that there was still activity going on down here around Pahala, and one earthquake over here northwest of Mauna Loa, really fairly low activity across the whole island in general here. So that's the last one day. But let's go up here and push, push it back to the last seven days. And close it, and you'll get a better idea of what was this recent activity here. So there it is. You can see the orange is that most recent stuff. So very little, just tailing off. Still hasn't died off entirely, right? There's still a little, little adjustment happening there. But you can see this this trend here, right? Of the, of the last week with some more diffuse activity near the caldera, and then more linear activity that kind of goes in a south southwest, then a west southwest, then a south south southwest, and a west southwest stepping over like that really interesting pattern that we can we'll look at here um, at what that could possibly mean, right? Um, in fact, let me just jump right right to here. We have, we've looked at this before, this model of how rift zones and, and the faults that connect different segments of dikes can propagate. And this old model goes back to Hill in 1977 that we see come up over and over and over again. And so it's not unusual to see something like that pattern where you see a segment, then a small fault, and a segment, and a small fault, and a segment, and a fault, and a segment. So, you yeah, know, that's that's pretty, right? Same pattern right there. Not unusual, right? And so you can see these cracks of the quad yeah, that match the East Rift Zone trend right there. It's one of these lineations. And the other lineation here seems to be more of a seismic Southwest Rift. So it's using those two natural weaknesses to wiggle its way across there, right? And um, that means that the magma coming if, if the magma is pushing its way through all this area, then it has access to all, to, to all the way to there, right? And so I can zoom it out a little bit so you can get a better idea here. We're not anywhere near the coast. We're still quite a ways away from the coast there, and that's still uppermost part of the Southwest Rift. And presumably that's because of some injection of magma into this area, which because it has a lot less flow of, of magma, you imagine it's a little bit more stagnant, more sticky, and um, harder to move, and things can take longer to move in there. And so. The story may not yet be over, but it happens pretty slowly over there, and very only very rarely does it actually pop out of the ground, and only during very unique times. Like in 74 was the last time that we had an eruption in this area, for uh, those that may be wondering that question or anticipate it here. So uh, that's, that's the pattern. We can look at it in a couple different other ways. So let's look at the USGS um, um, 
Kilauea monitoring map here. Whoop. And let's zoom it back in. And I believe I have it. This thing is not always my friend when I try to use it live, but let's see if we can get it to work here. All right, so here I think I believe I have it set to the last month. Yeah, the whole last month because you can see these white dots over here showing that precursor activity when we had um, earthquakes flaring in that upper east rift and summit area as well. Right, so that's the that's the before, and then here is the after. Going this way, like the more recent stuff. It's so really shifted from that eastern segment over to the western segment as a pressure relieved right through there essentially right okay so but one thing that we look at here in usgs page one thing that's that that nothing else uh gives us quite the same ability to plot is this earthquake plot page that's timed up and so you can see i've selected this this little window right over here this area this rectangle and i'm gonna click the view plot and i'm looking at the whole last month here and let's see if i can get this bigger for you guys uh, jerking around too much. Right, perfect. So early in the month, we had a couple of little flare-ups. You know, back in the fifth, the tenth, uh, eleventh, uh, uh, that that era when we had a slightly little bit of activity. We had a gap a gap in time, and then here's our first pulse that came through. We had a little gap right there, and here's our second pulse. Right, this this view makes it look like it actually got close to the surface, but this actually all the, all these things are spread out. They're not really part of that dike area. They're elsewhere, so that, that's a little bit misleading there. Just to point that out while I'm looking at it, and then there was lower uh, lower level of activity that continued for a little while, and recently the orange stuff here you can see has really died off. Right, There's, it's still happening. It's not quite all the way done. It's been waning. Um, it may never stop entirely because it just shifts to the next thing. But you can see that's the that's how it looks uh, with time um, as one of our variables now here one one month on the bottom. And perhaps I can make it do my bidding here. Let's see if I can go to the filter earthquakes. Let's get it to load me the last week only. Try to go back to the plots, and let's see if it gives me nope. It gives me the month plot. Let's try it again. Let's go back to the filter. Switch it to switch it to the week here. Let's try to force it to reload. Let's go back and try it. Oh no. Maybe if I reload it and do it one more time, give us one last shot. Get the way I'm monitoring map. And we'll move on. So alright. Last week. Earthquake plots. I'll select my area again. From there to oh. Let's pick from there to nope. It's not the area I wanted. From there to there. Let's make it skinny. Or than that. And now let's see if we can. Aha! There it is. There is one week. On this bottom axis here, so we actually have the first pulse is off the screen this way. We have our gap, and then here's our second pulse, and the following activity at lower levels, and you can see a little bit deeper as well, right? more in a deeper section and less so in the shallow section. The shallow section goes from being very intense to a little bit less to a little bit less all the way across. You know, and this is a depth of surface, sea level, one kilometer below sea level. Like, see, that's that's the, the pattern there. All right. Let's move on from this monitoring map for now, apart from pointing out, uh, if you ha didn't catch it before, that uh, uh, when we look at that sand hill tilt meter, that's located right over here. And that's why that northeast direction might point to this part of the earthquake cluster and the southeast point this direction. And why the northeast might also catch this whole Halemaumau area just beyond there as well. Right? So I do want to point out that we, there are our gas monitors all across here as well. And I will just briefly mention we're, we're checking out an interesting signal here at this very bottom one, um, HRPK, that we'll discuss. That was located way down here at bottom end, uh, close to one of these bends of the earthquake. So I'll bring that up again. Um, so that's just the location for, for now. Okay. So let's look 
at the time a little bit further, dig into this time variable of the earthquakes, and it looks like this page is not happy. Not happy. All right, let's reload it once again. A lot of these earthquake pages are not, uh, I am not lucky with during these, these uh, broadcasts. Okay, so here we go. Now we're looking at the earthquakes that are from the beginning of this event. Here's that first pulse showing up here, second pulse coming in, and then tailing off. And so let me see if I can get it a little closer for you guys so you can see it all. Like that. All right. I can speed it up a little. All right, first pulse. It's hard to tell, but we've mentioned before it begins right here and then it spreads to the north, spreads to the south. That's the first pulse. During the second pulse, you can see it really goes much more to the southwest. Let's see if I can get it to move a little bit. Be asking too much. You see it during the second pulse down this area over here. This is really a, that later stages that it comes in. Let's see as it loops around. To that first pulse, really nothing there, and then a the second pulse, it comes in. Really, it's this this later low level activity is when it's really showing that. And so that's the, the aspect of it with time. And um, we've been looking at this iris and this, this proxy of earthquakes per hour. So it's interesting to look at that plot. And then as a good affirmation here, we just have a, a volcano watch released today from USGS that has. Uh, their plot here, earthquakes per hour, with a nice scale. Uh, peaking at the maximum one was 28 for the first pulse, 24 for the second pulse here. And that same pattern right there, right? That one hump, second hump, and then this low level activity that's a little bit more spread out over here. And that's the, and the tilt meter that goes along with it, showing during those times, right? That's when the tilt meter is changing, rapid pace there and here. And it stays flat, stays flat, and it starts changing once again right there. It actually changes on the, the green line first, the that deeper section first. And then it's followed by a shallower northeast direction. And that goes on for a while all the way till here. Right? So really it's the green line that's dominant. It starts earlier and it ends later. And a blue line starts later and ends sooner. It's like a secondary so we really been dri driven by that southeast uh, rift area, right? So, um, and then since then it's been stable as we showed you earlier. So, one pulse, two pulses, three pulses. That's how it, how it looks in this uh, granular detail for which which we are appreciative of here. Um, if we look at the typical way we look at this in the USGS plot that's available automatically here, it's it's like this: it's earthquakes per day for the past month. So we really see. One peak, two peaks, three peaks, just like that. And we don't see that finer detail of that broadness of it over here or how sharp it was there. There, You do see that overall structure of one and the other, the gap, and then another, and then tailing off, right? And then this is that earlier August 5th and August 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th that, that was elevated beforehand that came up on our time depth plot as well, right there. So we'll zoom out one more time, past year. And so now you can see where the earthquakes per week it all gets dumped into a 1200 event week and our current week is already back over 400 so our, our, we're going to be back up in this similar background range probably as we were right before that and uh, which puts us essentially still at elevated uh, activity levels and we'll wait to see if it tails off or if it stays at that, at that level persistently and that leads to something else at the summit in shorter order rather than later. What's going on right now? I'm going to finish off that section here with a couple other observations. First is looking at the 48 hour seismographs at the summit. And uh, let, me, let me reload. Well, I think it's right here. You can see that there are some, some short pulses of trimmer still happening, which is normal, right? But you can see there's probably still movement and adjustment happening. It's not as the easiest thing to read, but you can just see that there you know, not as many of these actual earthquake events, but you still see the trimmer. And it, it has to be consistent across multiple of these graphs for it to be believable. 
right? So that's that's why we look at multiple multiple ones of them side by side, and I'm maybe be stronger next to the next to the areas the seismic monitor that's closer to the source. So we we'll, won't go into a huge amount of detail with that. Um, we do want to look at the gas as well. Uh, the last manual measurement back at 45 tons per day and at 26th. Uh, nothing else came up yet. Let me give it a reload just to make sure. This is a monthly um, monthly monitoring data from the USGS. Nothing new came up on there. We do have ambient measurements, measurements though. So here is one at uh, HRC CPK. That's Cone Peak. And you see our scale is from 0 0.1 to 0 0.55 ppm. Right? So there are variations, natural variations, wind and all that. It's not, you know, all good. Here's our Sand Hill HRSDH raw data. And 0 to 1 ppm, variations, all that. And then here's our curious signal where we look at HRPKE, the one I pointed out on the map earlier. Our scale goes from 0, 10, 20, 30 to 60 ppm. And there is a curious, I'm not sure if this is actually real data, right? And, you know, I would suspect it might be, but I don't know. I don't know. We're ask, waiting for uh, some information from USGS. Um, but it looks like it was somewhere not quite 50 ppm, maybe, you know, high 40 ppm um, just at that one site and just for a short time and just once. And that's why you have to, you have to question whether there was something instrumental happening at that time or maybe... If most activity was underground in these in this crack system, maybe there was a a, a a burp of magmatic gas that found its way out one of these cracks and just happened to waft over this sensor at just at the right time where it picked it up once. So it's still to be determined. Uh, no conclusion here yet. It's a curious signal that we're just awaiting more information on. So uh, in any case, it's not anything to be alarmed about. There, it doesn't mean you know. Um, there, that area is so cracked, and there's a lot of space underground, as, as we're seeing where the magma can move, even without a whole lot of seismicity. So nothing to be worried about. It's all away, away from people. But it's a curiosity that that um, we'll see if we can tug at a little more and if anything else comes up. Okay, uh, a few more things here. This is the sand hill tilt that we wanted to show you once again. And pointed that out before, just to recap, you know... Um, Essentially flat, maybe down a little bit, up a little bit, but more noticeable going up here at the right end of the the, the northeast component. And if I zoom it back out, you can see that the rate previously about a month ago you know, it was coming up as well, but the rate appears that maybe maybe just a little steeper. It's pretty close. Maybe a little steeper. It's, I'm curious to see if this is actually coming up any faster, right? And that's what it looks like over at Sand Hill. And that's over to the southwest, as I showed you guys on the map. And so let's look at the kilowatt information data from the USGS, the one that's the that's usually uh, compared year after year from eruptions at the summit and the rift zone at Wikahuna up um, by the former Jagger Museum. In the last two days, you can see 2.5 microradians of range and some variations, which are interesting because it seems like there's little pulses of mini pulses of pressure coming through that show up on, on multiple tilt meters. But overall, the scale isn't that great. Here's the last week. It goes from 2.5 to minus 1.5. That's 4 microradians. And you can see that it's, it went down. It's popped up a little bit. It's generally rising in the last few days. But it hasn't risen very much. Here it is for the last month. Generally rising. Here is essentially the last week of activity that may have related to intrusion. And not a whole lot of variation, right? If the, you know, Even though you, you might be able to tie these different peaks to events happening happening there may be some some connection it must be pretty weak because our whole range of change here uh, is less than a previous background activity right that was in the range of five microradians and maybe only three right here so pretty small compared to what we saw um, back here on the sand hill tilt meter which just in case you need it me to blow it up so you can see it better is on a scale of 120 microradians in total rather than one or two or four or that kind of thing so that's the the nature of the tilt here um and so we'll see you know it doesn't it's not quite clear what's going on here with with uh, this trend if that relates to what we're seeing on, on that other component on sand hill there's a lot of times you just gotta wait and see what's ha happening with this volcano so we'll move on to the gps here it is at the summit uh our summit cross caldera distance 
and it's showing a contraction across that distance that occurred and it looks like it's perhaps stabilized here um, over the last couple of data points, couple of days or so. And this is something we discussed before, I'll mention it again, of, of how uh, the intrusion being south of both the stations, let's come back up to the map here, the intrusion being south of both, both of these stations, wrong button, over here, means it could actually push both of them to the north. And we see Critter Rim going to the north quite a bit, and Wikahuna going a lesser amount with a net contraction there. That's that's the, the basic story, and I'll show you the data here shortly. But that's the detail of what it looks like now as far as the difference between the two stations. Five-year plot over at Pu'o'o. It's still not a lot of change, still a very small scale, so we'll just uh, uh, keep going from that and jump right to the two-year GPS plot signals here. So Uekahuna is that northern plot, plot there, so here is the north component. Was getting pushed to the north. You can see it slowed down a little bit there. It was getting pushed as well to the east up to the east on the east component and it was rising at a similar rate fairly unchanged right but essentially got pushed extra north and east um, over at byron's ledge which is farther to the east we can see we were pushed uh, we actually sag perhaps sagged to the west and didn't really change a whole lot visibly in the north and south the one that's the other end of that ruler is crater rim over here and you can see crater rim if i can zoom it in more had a, a very big push to the east and a very big push to the north and a very big push up as well so it was pretty close to that intrusion is essentially why it was deformed so much so you really get that very 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 fast north minus the slightly less fast north and that's a contraction a let uh, net uh, shortening of the distance between these two stations at crater rim and uikahuna this over here is outlet the one that's most directly over that area and you can see it was pushed East, so it's actually you can see it's slightly to the to the east of that area, right? That was most mostly uh, affected, but it was pushed to the east, an order of one, two, three, four and a half, maybe centimeters or so. Uh, you can see it was pushed to the north on, a, on the order of well, maybe five centimeters or so, and it was pushed up on the order of ten centimeters or so. At the outlet station. So this may not be the center of deformation, but this is maybe the closest station is showing the most displacement there. Um, 10 centimeters being about four inches or so, right? If you're um, trying to convert that. Okay. Mana Ulu, you don't see a whole lot uh, on the East Rift. You know, uh, we can maybe dig into that a little more. There's really not a whole lot you can see elsewhere in other places. There are some stations on a nearby south flank like Ahua uh, that are also showing quite a bit of movement to the east a little bit to the north and a little bit up. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to the source of all these plots. And we often look at them like this because it's easier to navigate and getting the monitoring map all the time. But today I'm going to go back to the monitoring map and show you guys uh, where these GPS stations actually are, right? So that's the outlet station right there. And if you click on, on a star and click on there, that gives you the plot that we just were looking at, the outlet right there. Um, let's see if I can... It to, oh, right there's our there's our gas uh, gas and and tilt meter at Sand Hill. Our other gas meter is down here, in which there's also a GPS station. Unfortunately, some of these stations on the monitoring map don't always pop up. KOSM. There are other work workarounds. So in this case, I'm going to uh, come over here to the Nevada Genetic Labor Laboratory and pull up KOSM. And show you guys a lifetime plot of the station, which is hard to hard to really uh, pick out because right, we're looking at since the year 2000. This is 20 years of data now, right? But you can see that at the very very end, in this magenta color, they are plotting rapid GPS, and so we can see the trend at the very least from these plots. So on the east signal here, we can see that we're not going east; we're going west at KOSM, right? west, and we're going. This is going to be the north south west and south end up at KOSM. So let me pop back to this monitoring map because the location is important, right? So back up over here, going west, south, and up. And that's a direction at KOSM, right? Um, further over, I wonder if I can get this. It's maybe another lost cause, but maybe I can get this earthquakes to 
pan out to, to hide itself over there. That would be fantastic, but I don't think it's happening here. All right, we'll just deal with it. Let me zoom it out a little bit so you can see it better then. All right, so outlet was moving east, north, and up. KOSM was moving west and south. Ahua was moving east and north. And we can look, let's look over here at Mane. Two years, we're moving to the east. Mostly to the east, not really any change. And the signal's moving slightly south still, not really any change in the up, but certainly pushed to the east. So that would be that station getting pushed to the east right there, right? So perhaps from something happening over in this direction, right? Although the center must be further this way if this GPS station is, is showing a net movement over to the south and to the west. Right? There's another station over here, which is Cone Peak. Um, that's the gas. Didn't show anything unusual. Let's see if I can get the GPS to pop up. That one also does not operate. So let me go to the Cone Peak from Nevada. Judetic Laboratory. And this is going to be maybe not quite 20 years, 15 years or so of data, but we can see that we're moving to the west and we are moving to the north and we're moving up. All right, so back to our map. West, north, and up. That goes there, that goes there. And right, so that's the pattern. Everything pointing away from a radial area right in here. Okay. That's what we can see with the GPS. I thought it might be, might be cool to dig into that a little bit more than we have in the past here. So next, we can show you guys the recent USGS map of intrusive activity from August 23rd or 30th that was issued a couple days ago with a likely deformation source area plotted in this dashed red line. And you can see it falls pretty much in accordance to where we just examined those GPS stations. I'll try to get it an intermediate size for you guys here, right? So there is the earthquakes of this event that are plotted in circles here. The purple are the, the previous lava flows. And so in 74, there was activity that came down this pathway uh, under different circumstances that we'll get into in the future and then erupted out of here. And that's what the purple actually is. In 71, it came further up from the Hale Mau chamber, a different pathway going that way. Right? And there are also our overflows um, from the, this, this, uh, the 1974 eruption, um, Upper East Rift connector area right in there, which we won't go into today either. But that's the, Caldera, the South Caldera area with uh, the connector there, um, um, Southwest Rift connector as an analog over here. That upper part of it only being that likely deformation source, right? With Pu'ukua'e, this is likely the, uh, the station, right, that I uh, didn't, that I only gave you guys the, the, the letters for is probably that one. And so that's, that's what that looks like, and that's the, the likely deformation map area. And following it up with what we began with here, the INSAR satellite data, right, which is showing once again in that exact same area, Maybe not exact same area, but similar area right there, uh, showing that center of deformation. So I want to come back to where this is posted on the USGS page and show you their caption here. All right, INSAR from two, two passes, August 19th and September 1st. This came from an Italian space agency's Cosmo SkyMed satellite. It's interesting. Um, it's saying each cycle represents uh, one and a half centimeters or 0.6 inches of change in distance. So um, there's also a factor of uh, the satellite looking uh, at the ground at an angle of 40 degrees off vertical so that both horizontal motions and uplift subsidence contribute to the range change. So it complicates conversions between the range change and ground motion. So it also causes location of maximum range change to be shifted slightly to the east of where the maximum uplift occurred given this particular satellite flight path. Nonetheless, it shows a maximum uplift of 14 centimeters, 15 point or 5.5 inches of range change, which can be generated by 18 centimeters or seven inches of uplift. And so this number over here, 18 centimeters, seven inches is, is a number we're seeing most often that fits the models of how much uplift there actually was uh, generated underground to show the what the satellite showed, saw at a skewed angle, basically, right? So 18 centimeters, seven inches, and we'll come to that later. We'll come. We'll touch ba base back on 
this issue of the the offset right this might be offset slightly to the east so it might actually originate slightly to the west we'll get into this a little bit more after our break in our question section um, because uh, it's a question that Dane had for the USGS and we'll start off after we do our thank yous and questions we'll start off our next segment by uh, talking about um, um, that question in particular but before we do our questions right now real quick Dane I know we're dying to, dying to get them but I just want to just run real quick around the base bases on Mauna Loa here's a view of the southwest rift because nothing's happening in Mauna Loa latest update 58 earthquakes not erupting no changes in data streams uh, tilt and GPS not no daily daily signals nothing really no change in GPS I just put it on screen here for the record vertical motion it's really flat nothing is going on there earthquakes for the past week not nothing but not not the levels we've seen before here's the last month similar to before and my last base here Dane is earthquake rates for the past year still low um, in the range of 50 earthquakes per week much lower than 300 ish that we're getting earlier in a year so real quick i know you know that much happening about loa but i think it's important that we just mention that nothing's happening even if it's not that exciting there it is she's done so we are brought to you by hawaii tracker and we can get more of our text updates on there and with that i will uh turn to dane here to help us say our thank yous Right. Um, I There is one thing that came up. I don't know if you have it in prep uh, for the second part, but USGS uh, added a new web camera to their arsenal, this time over by Sand Hill, looking to the south. Uh, I sent you a link. Okay, awesome. I will get it up here. But yeah, just a new little thing that uh, I like how they're getting the new cams or temporary cams positioned for relevant areas You know, pretty quickly. Yeah. In case something goes down there. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. So, yeah, we have a few things to go through. Uh, thank yous to give out. First is going to be to the people that have been helping make this uh, possible through monetary donations. We do take donations on hawaiitracker.com slash support. And with that, we have Steve, and, uh, Steve S., Jessica Ann, Judy P., Katrin G., Jana K., Robert G, Lori H, Robin M, and Victoria D. We appreciate everybody that continues to support us, uh, bringing you this type of content and putting the research into it. Mahalo, guys. Uh, we also, yeah, thank you. We also are brought to you by uh, Kaleo's Bar and Grill in the heart of Pahoa. Uh, they are a fine cuisine re restaurant that does some unique twists on some more traditional Dishes adds a little bit of local flair to it. That are, uh, I really enjoy their fish and chips. Eat there regularly. They have indoor, outdoor dining options, takeout options. So everything you need for the pandemic dining experience. Um, I really appreciate them uh, supporting this stream. And yeah, check out Cleo's Bar and Grill. Good for locals, good for anybody visiting as well. Uh, second one is Kalani Tours out of the out of Kona and they do a variety of different tours, smaller uh, tour groups as opposed to the big tours where everybody gets on a bus. These are more personalized tours where you get to know a little bit more about the tour guides as well as the areas that you're visiting, get a little bit of that uh, local kind of knowledge. They also keep you out of trouble. They do uh, volcano tours, waterfall tours, and some kind of coffee farm tours. So we appreciate them you're coming to the islands. Definitely check them out. And we are brought to you by a grant through the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Puna Strong Grant, which was funded by the County of Hawaii. So, and we appreciate uh, everybody that helps make this type of content uh, possible. Mahalo, everybody. Mahalo. All right. So we have a couple questions here. Uh, I'll keep my eye on the chat to see if any more come across. Uh, first one is a is from Matt Hacker. He's talking about the tremor signals on the seismometers that we were looking at a little bit ago, but more, more about the signals that we're seeing in the last couple of hours, the, what looks like a tremor there. Mm -hmm. And if that's, uh, what, if you think that is a restart of activity or something else. Well, we, uh, uh, uh real quick, I just, I put up the sand Hill camera here and they just sent me Dane. So thank you for that. Um, 
we haven't shown it a lot in the intervening times between the end of the eruption of the in in, in, in May um, and this activity recently. Um, but there's been tremor in that area. It seems like not continuous for a while, but occasionally, occasional tremor. It seems like it's gone on for a long time, ever since eruption, and it hasn't really stopped, as far as I'm aware. It may have slowed down at some points in time, and it may have picked up a little bit again. So, um, to cut to the chase, uh, I don't know that that means that it's going to start back up, because it can do that even during those in-between background times as well. I can just kind of rearrange down in there. It's just a matter of finding a spot where it can't get out is where the issue actually lies, right? So, um, I am I'm a little bit curious about that possible gas signal, and if we'll see, you know, other further developments and gas leaking out elsewhere, that might indicate some next phase, um, or maybe that's it, and we continue continue adjusting, and you know, we'll we'll see in a, what the historical patterns are for previous earthquakes and what happened around them. Of course, every eruption is different; and never happens the same way exactly twice. So, uh, but it's cool to, cool to look at the patterns and see, you know, what the what the ranges of possibilities might be. Definitely. So, one of the the only other question I got here is a little bit outside of the current events of uh, Kilauea or even recent. Uh, Richard asks, "Has USGS? Well, actually, no. This is current. Sorry." Richard asks, uh, "Has USGS analyzed and compared seismic tremor data at various depths to see if there might be different characteristics per depth?" I don't know. That's a question for the USGS directly there, yeah. And I don't know. I don't know. Um, I have not right. seen them release that publicly. Um, they do all kinds of stuff uh, within the USGS that doesn't get released publicly. So I cannot really speak on what, what hasn't been released publicly. That's, um, but that's, yeah, that's something clearly what Richard is getting at is that, you know, there might, you know, you might see different characters of, of the, signal the vibration of the ground in different at different depths to see if there's something to tell about possible pathways or sources or that kind of thing which might give you more more the components of what's going on here the geometry so it's interesting interesting to think about we haven't got that level of detail right you know we're, we're honestly just happy we got the insar to be honest right happy. well that'll do it for the first q a um we will be taking more questions in the chat and if uh, we'll, if anybody asks anything that I can't answer, we will pass it to Philip to see what he has to say. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Dane. And yeah, thanks for the camera here. There, there it is, and it's labeled image of the 1982 outlet flow from the Sand Hill area. So it's just one more webcam down in that area in case something were to happen that's already deployed. Right, so that's great. You know, we got to remember that USGS has their main center of operations now down in Hilo, and not not quite as close by. So everything that's set up in advance is, is better than having to deploy. Um, not that it's that far, really. All right, so we're gonna gonna uh, pick up with this uh, volcano watch from last week um, that is comparing um, this some intrusion to past activity here. And without going through everything here, they do mention that there are a couple uh, different analogs, right? In seeking to understand current events, volcanologists often look to the past. We look for analog events that are similar to what's happening that will give us a sense for what the future might hold. A very close analog event for this week's activity was an intrusion in 2015. Now this was only, I'm um, going to cut in here, this is only through the first pulse when this was written, right? So there wasn't a second pulse yet, and that may be where it actually differs from 2015. But uh, uh, let me step back out here. You know, it does talk about 2015, uh, starting with inflation in the shallow magma reservoir, which triggered overflow of the summit lava lake onto the floor of the crater. So that's where it was already a little bit different. There was already an eruption happening at Pu'o and a lava lake at Halemaumau, and then it pressurized and backed up to 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 flow um, the intrusion in 2015. Um, so. Interesting pattern of deformation, the seismicity is similar, um, even though 2015 started differently. They also mention a third similar event was recorded in 2006, prior to the lake, and then they go on into, you know, the connections to the Southwest Rift and all of that, right? So, um, without going further into it than that, let's just look quickly at some of the historical seismicity that we have here. So, I've, I've lined up a few of these uh, eras, um, and so right here we have 2015. 
um, from the beginning of April to the end of July, right, to the very beginning of August. And for all of these, I mean, I bought up, but you have down here this, the, the similar um, histogram of frequency, right, uh, hourly plots. You can see that the event was mostly during this period right over here, and you can, you know, it gives you some idea of how long this actually lasts, right? So this is looking at really it was middle of May, uh, mid late, late May, and it was late late uh, April. So it was about a month long event here. And let me play it starting from April. You can see background seismicity, not a whole lot happening. And then you can see the whole summit pressurizing earthquakes all around the summit region before you see this burst that happens down here, right? And you see a little bit of smattering of earthquakes all the way down to where we see them today, in fact. But it was really one burst. It, the, the burst was a single burst, and, and that's where the difference really was, right? You see, if I zoom in on this on this uh, histogram here, this first peak is a summit inflation area, right? And then this is the actual peak of our of our intrusion right here. I'm going to zoom it back out and hope it stays on there. So. I can I'm gonna grab it and drag it back and forth here. So before and after, that's that pulse, the seismicity that we're seeing right there in 2015. Right. And so I did want to play. I did play it in the next couple months afterwards, so that you can see um, that there really wasn't a whole lot in this case. It really didn't do. You know, it it it, it was a pretty quick event overall. Um, Really, just a few days for that that southwest rift zone area. Although you can do see you know a little bit of seismicity picking up during a summit area inflation, it does pick up flares off everywhere, including here, and then it dies off again. So 2015, you know, um, interesting. Maybe we're past 2015 now that we can say, okay, well there was a lava lake, there was an eruption at Pu'u, and there was in the second phase. It only lasted a couple couple days, but you know, may, maybe a couple days is, is similar. Ours lasted. On, a, on an order of days, right, one week, and not on the order of months, for example. So not not too far in that sense, but uh, to give you some idea of what was going on, this is the Smithsonian Institute's uh, Global Volcanism Program report in Kilauea from July 2015, and uh, this talks about there was a lot happening, right, you know, um, lava was flowing near Pahoa, there was a lava lake, um, um, Hale Ma Ma'u, um, Overflows of the of the lava lake onto the floor of Hale Ma'u Ma'u happening. Right here's a map of the lava, lava flow that was going towards Pahoa Pahoa Town right over here, and lava flows from Pu'u that broke out and then went into that giant crack and then popped back out of the crack and flowed back down. And story for another day, but that's the era that this 2015 thing fits into. There was a lot going on. Um, so if you didn't hear about this lava lake overflow or this intrusion, it's because there was a lot of other stuff going on at the time, like most likely. Right, so I don't want to show everything about that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna scroll all the way down here, but um, if we do if we do focus on deformation here, it does say that deformation was dominated uh, in the first quarter of 2015 by the episode of inflation in the South Caldera area that started in early February and continued through the end of March. And so you can see that there is deformation was going on um, for a couple months or so, right? In that case, right? so it may, it may have had some some secondary phase where after it breaks through, it can more slowly keep deforming and swelling that area. So that that may, may, may be what we have facing us as one possibility as a slower continuation um, swelling of this event. So maybe that's enough, enough about 2015. Let's go back a little further to 2006. 2006 is something we have a little bit more information about, but let's first play you guys this the sequence here, 2006. We're going from the beginning of March uh, through the end of September because there are uh, there's a lot of low level activity right so you can see at the beginning of march it's it's not all happening all at once but it is activating a lot of the same areas it's just drawn out over the course of six months or so right? and it's really slow drawn out it activates the same area all the way down right um that we're seeing today with similar similar kind of curvatures right like that um and interesting, no single peak, a lot of really, you know, low level, like kind of like we saw, like that second phase, right? Where maybe we had broken some barrier earlier on right here, and then we can just have low level activity for a while without having to have that m massive seismic crisis. So that's one aspect of what it actually looked like. So you can see that there, you know, there was an initial phase early on, um, right there. Similarly, it starts up here. 
then only later does it start filling in these lower areas. So that's 2006. In 2006, uh, is something we've shown before. This is a map of the earthquakes from 2004, 5, and 6, and overlaying to an image of the INSAR for one period of time uh, during this intrusion event, the middle part or so, right? Um, and it's tied to the GPS, so, you know, um, in this case, uh, it's it's thought that that offset is, is corrected. Um, and if you were to compare it, it's hard to tell exactly um, but there might be a little bit of, a, of an offset still from the center of this inflation center 2006, what we saw now. Um, that, that's, not a, that's not a big problem considering what they saw in 2006 and, and research further. Um, that comes from this paper by David Meyer et al., uh, 2008, and JVGR, right? And um, they, they estimate, here I'm not going to do everything in this paper, but there's a, there's a few interesting things to talk about, right? They, they have two different slices there that estimate 7.7 centimeters plus 8.9 centimeters. Right? So that ends up being 16.6 centimeters, if I'm correct. And that's pretty close to what we're seeing now as far as our order of magnitude of change as well, right? As far as the insider is showing, perhaps. Um, they give some volumes, etc. else. Um, um, they say here, GPS data indicate inflation occurred steadily over nine months between mid-January and mid-October, marking injection of a sill unlikely. So they actually believe that this inflation is a recharge of a shallow ductal area under the Southwest Rift. Right? So this is an interesting aspect of this, which is it's just, uh, interesting to pull out. And we'll, we'll talk about it here briefly, right? But just a little bit to show you guys here some of these same GPS stations that we were looking at earlier. Ahua and Mane, you can see similar kind of analysis moving to the east and to the east, and this one moving to the west at KOSM once again, and to the north, and to the south, to the south, to the south, and which ones are moving up, Ahua. So that's why why it's worth looking at the preliminary version of that, right, without having it been published yet. Um, and if you were to draw those vectors like I was trying to do on a map, you can see similar thing here. Here's Uwekahuna, away. KOSM, HUA, money, right? So that's, that's the idea, right? All pointing back to a source similar to what we have now in here, and that's why, why I run all that up earlier and I'm tying it back together now. All right, so well, let me go back here too. Where am I? All right. So um, well, there's some error analysis in here. I mean, and there's that, that image itself, right? Okay, so. The important thing here, all right, so for a wide range of parameters of their models, here is what they come up with. They arrive at a similar result, and they basically say that the, what fits their model is a 13 to 15 centimeter thick, that's five to six inches thick, subhorizontal body that is shallow, one or two kilometers below the ground surface, and broad, three to four kilometers wide and eight to nine kilometers long that dips down very shallowly 12 to 16 degrees to the southwest. All right, so it's basically saying that underneath this area is, it's not exactly a blade of lava because it's more of a mush that's sitting in there. There's a lava blade that went into a zone of, that was already still mush and added to the mush is what they're proposing. And that's happening over this whole broad area right over here. And perhaps that's fed by the activity of the magma coming along this dike system and then along this area, and perhaps from there is where it gets somehow gets into this area here. Now, it's not quite clear exactly how that happens, right? But this is a pattern that we see where the inflation center seems to be further over in this area where you don't really see any any earthquakes, and everything is over here on the on the eastern edge of them, right? Which is interesting. We'll come come into that here um, as well. Um, but first, let's uh, come back into this this uh, from for some paper uh, 1801 um, showing similar sequences, right? So we talked about going back in time, 2006. Here it is, sequence summit. I'm sorry, summit area here. This is that Namakane Payo area. Let's zoom it in so we can all see it better. Right? And there's a that southwest rift area, and it actually actually some a seismic transport. Perhaps, and some 
possible injection all the way down, down to there, right? And that's like along the, the rift zone area. Not a whole lot of south flank. The south flank is over here. Not a whole lot of south flank response in this particular case. This is a little bit of action over here, closer to the healing the poly area, but that that's typical when you see this whole movement adjusting so that magma can get in here in the first place. You, you have to kind of trigger it with something over here. So that's that's all all good. It's really um, that corresponds to there. No no response further down in this case. Okay, we're gonna go back in time to 1982. In 1982, you can see here we had a similar. South Caldera, uh, South Caldera area, a connector over here, and something along the rift zone. But these these deeper depths over here are, are is what the colors mean, or different colors mean. And you're actually seeing, a, in this case, a south flank response, right? South flank response in the deeper areas. You see some of the shallower stuff over here. So perhaps once again, you have this aseismic gap where the magma is able to move through more of an open area without breaking anything but still putting pressure on the south flank to go over and gets all the way down to here in this case, right? It gives you a little bit of the idea of the nature of this area of how it can move through some areas aseismically. Usually up here, it does, it does actually uh, uh, set off those earthquakes. This is an area that the earthquakes do go off all the time for, for, for reasons we'll, we'll continue to explore here. Right, so that's June 82, not long before that. August 81, similar kind of thing, South Caldera, here is that southwest rift zone. In this case, we actually did see seismicity all the way down. Did not see the gap, right? Interesting, right? The gap is only comes post nineteen eighty one, but sometimes it did maybe a slightly different path where it did break some more rock or something like that. But we see both that all the way down, and we see a south flank response, right? And we'll look at that, that, that era eighty one eighty two in more detail, and then finally we'll we won't quite get back too far into the seventies. But here's nineteen seventy six. This actually follows a big earthquake in Kalapana in late 75, right? So you had a whole south flank response moving over there. So in response, you could imagine that there could have been some injection of magma into the whole south flank separating. And you really can see that perhaps after magma movement through the southwest rift area, we had a massive south flank adjustment at this lower end, lowest southwest edge of it, right? Pretty much close to this border zone of the edge of Kilauea here, that last chunk of south flank. Right? That was post-75 earthquake. So we won't get into that as much in the 70s. We'll, we'll leave that for the future. We'll tease it a little bit like we just did there. But let's look a little bit in more detail at the sequence of earthquakes from the, the 80s here. And so I now have it from 1980 to 83, three whole years. And you can see the pattern of three years of earthquakes right over here in total. Right. And we'll pull it back and play it, starting off slow. And see, there it is at that South Color area. See, I'm, I'm excluding what's happening elsewhere in a volcano everywhere else, because I'm trying to really focus in just on this aspect today, and I'll give you a hint of what I'm excluding at the end here. But you can see there that, that first sequence in 81 right here. And you can see it, initial sequence coming up right, coming in that South Color area. It migrates that first little section. You get a couple of hints of events starting to come further down. And then after a little while, a buildup of earthquakes at this lower area over here. Then you see earthquakes all the way down the rest of the way. Right in late August of 1981 there. And it gets fairly quiet for a little while. You still have some level of activity before we start seeing a flare off again, once again over here. Maybe I can zoom it in a little bit for you guys. It starts to flare off in that South Caldera area once again. And then once again, comes back down that area here to the southwest. Right? And you do see some south flank response as well, a little bit in that case. So this is, I wanted to, to you know put it all, all the way to 83, right? So you can really see the multi-year long-term pattern a little bit of this. Right? Where it, it goes a little bit, it stops, it might go a little bit again, it might stop, it might go a little bit further down, and stop, it might go further. Um, it might go all the way, and then back up. Um, there could be pulses and pulses and pulses that last for a while, right? 2006, it lasted nine months. Right, and so we've only seen two pulses right now, and it seems like it might be over. It may well not do anything else, but it wouldn't be a surprise to see more 
adjustments in the future, right? And not just under Halimakmawa area, but also this recent area of adjustment as well. That's 81, 82. One more time there, right? Last, last bump there at the end. That's that flank adjustment too. All right, so we're gonna turn to Dane's question now that I teased a little bit earlier. Where Dane tweeted to US Just Volcanoes, any thoughts on the offset between earthquake locations and the peak inflation point appears in INSAR. It seems to be historically consistent. He shows the paper we just showed you guys. He shows the INSAR with the earthquakes uh, to the side. And USGS says, maybe I should try to make this bigger so you guys can see it. The shift in INSAR detected center can be significant depending on the look angle. Regardless, deformation and seismicity need not line up exactly. The quakes are going to occur where the rock breaks, which might not be the center deformation, but more to the edges. Right, and so we've described a little bit of that, that theory from 2006, the hypothesis of what there might be going on, of how you could have a broad deformation source off to the side and then earthquakes over on one of the edges of it, for example. So that's one, one version of it there, right? I do want to add in one um, um, other um, complication here, which is, is, comes from a paper of, uh, by Petruska et al., 2018. We're looking at a slice of time from 72 to 74. Let me blow this up. So you can see what was going on here a little bit. You're not going to get it all, and that's the point isn't to get it all necessarily right now. Right? You have the seismic southwest rift down here. In '74, there were eruptions that, that occurred um, in multiple multiple uh, places. Right? There was July, there was September, there was July, there was September came up over here, and then there was December. So we had magma coming into the whole summit system, the shallow chamber. The deeper chamber, it was pushing through over to the East Rift Zone before that. It was bypassing the summit to the East Rift Zone. Somehow it was so full, it was like it was just taking a detour around and bypass, right? And also, most importantly here in December 74, we have uh, at least one component of the magma, if not a large component of the magma, bypassing the summit as well and coming up in this upper Southwest Rift Zone area. So there can be all kinds of things going on. You can certainly have magma coming back into this area it could be pushing on the edge by, through a dike. It could be going through some other off to the side uh, mush zone, right? That's not drawn in here. That it could flow into that kind of thing as well, right? While also pressurizing that shallower chamber and leading to changes we can see at that Halamao area as well, right? Not to mention eventually also down Upper East Rift and further, right? You know, you can see in this case in 72, it was only getting so far down to East Rift because really so much was going on. It's hard to. Hard to seal off all the exits to push it all the way down enough. It took another 10 years for that to happen um, after this. Right? They did go through and pulse this down there to try to get the way going, but the pool was 10 years later when it actually began. All right, so let's dig into this, this uh, exchange a little more. Um, all right, and we have uh, Dr. Cliff Thurber coming in here and adding some insight. He says a couple of things. Um, first, he says, if the formation is due to dike intrusion and the dike dips, then depending on where the earthquakes are occurring, near the dike top, near its bottom, and the dike height, one would observe different offsets between the earthquakes and the center deformation. So to show you guys what he might mean by that, let me move past that one to here, to uh, a study, classic study by Carpen and Thurber, right? That's his, that's his work right there, back in 1987. He's been working with the USGS for a long, long time. Um, here is the area of the initiation of the 1981 earthquakes, right? We showed you how there was the beginning and then later later worked its way down further on. We're looking at just the beginning part of it right here, right? And we're going to look at two cross sections coming. Uh, well, at least one cross section coming coming across here uh, um, shortly. Um, but first, you know, this initial part here, they did say, because we're trying to look at the context historically, right? Um, that it was preceded by surface deformation and activity quite unlike the other previous Upper East Rift Zone events. Beginning December 1980, the center of inflation, some inflation and shallow earthquakes had migrated towards the southern section of the caldera. All right, that's something I'm going to jump in that we also saw, saw recently. Uh, shift in earthquakes to the south and shift, shift in inflation um, center to the south as well. Right, that was showing in our cross caldera distance. Okay, back over here um, into, into their paper, um, a little, little excerpt of it. Um, on January 19th, this is one day ahead. The monitoring station south of the summit began recording sharp local changes in electrical resistivity and suggesting magma movement south of the summit. The earthquake swarm occurred one day later on January 20th. The summit continued inflating less than three microradians total. The swarm lasted about 20 hours with no recorded shallow or deep harmonic tremor, right? No tremor at all 
during that particular event, right? And that's why I wanted to read this since we have the trimmer is interesting, right? The trimmer is not necessarily always like your 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 smoking gun, right? It, it, you can have stuff without trimmer, you can have trimmer happening and not lead to stuff. Um, the trimmer certainly amplifies when stuff is happening. That's uh, that's undeniable, right? But it's not exactly something that's easy to every time it's like this. All right, so they say here that they relocated all the hypercenters, um, and we'll talk about that uh, uh, shortly as well. Um, they define a blade light feature two kilometers long by one kilometer high with a basal depth two kilometers below sea level, dipping 72 degrees to the east-southeast. Although there's no systematic migration of earthquakes with depths, the hypercenters progressively migrated into the southern, southern section of the caldera from the point to the south. So I'll, we'll show about that, let's talk about that as well. This is a little bit different in the fact that it migrated from south to north, and it was a little bit different in that case early in 81, right? They talk about um, strike slip solutions and um, in echelon intrusions, and so that's, that's, that's enough. Okay, let's look at, this is the cross section from B to B prime. Maybe one less here. B to B prime. And so if I pull back here, that's B to B prime there. We're looking across these earthquakes that are once again narrow in a tight zone, right? Elongated north and south, but packed tightly east and west, just as we have in our current activity today. So you can see sea level is zero, one kilometer down, two kilometers down, and you can see there is an angle to this pattern of earthquakes right here, right? So this is where they're getting a 72 degree dip to the southeast. So what they're saying is, if you have your intrusion, something like this, and let's say that it was poking up over this way, you might have deformation happening on a map surface over here. And you might have earthquakes happening over here, above this zone. Right? That's one explanation if you have have enough of a dip. And obviously, if the, th if the thing dips even more, then you can have an even larger gap between them. But 72 degrees might be enough for just a little bit for some. Right? So that's, that's that. Um, this is pretty shallow, one to two kilometers below sea level. But let's let's keep keep poking at this. Um, if we look at the uh, recent tweet that we highlighted from Jeffersonite, um, with these two different clouds of earthquakes of a current current activity, right? The blue plat pattern here being a shallower stuff that's more has an aspect ratio that's that's longer both north and south and east and west than that is tall that I've been describing as a maybe sill, right? And you have this other sequence which is elongate north and south. Um, it's skinnier. Um, east and west, but there is this other, you can see on the map pattern here, these bigger earthquakes off to the side here, right? This appears to me um, like it's some other pre-existing fault, right? And this whole side is getting pushed by the dike opening right there, right? So there's some other feature getting activated over here, but really the, the dike feature is right in here, pretty narrow. And zooming in on it, it's hard to tell. It's, you know, it's the closest I can get this zoom. Maybe there is a dip. You know, may maybe... It could be something like that, you know, I mean, it wouldn't be a huge span, right? But even within this zone, right? And if maybe if the deck's happening over here, you know, maybe, maybe you could have something that's a little bit off where you can have that little bit of an offset. So that's a possibility as well, right? That's not what we just talked, saw in a 2006 paper by Meyer at all. They're describing a, a different zone, right? That on this plot wouldn't, doesn't really fall into this map, right? But they're saying that's between one and two kilometers below the surface. The surface is up here. One or two kilometers down would be this range being some mush zone somewhere that this dike is feeding somewhere somewhere further down over here, right? So that's one option. Um, other options as well, right, with this this earthquake pattern here. So perhaps it being inclined. I took I took uh, Jefferson Knight's plot here and I, I, I'm going to unveil here uh, even for Dane, this new little cube, 3D cube, just re-portray that same image so you can get it maybe those of you guys who are you know a little uh, uh, can visualize it a little bit better right here's that map view on top and how it's elongate in that north south direction but on this east west direction it's it's further over i can actually zoom this in pretty well um, maybe i can see here maybe i can convince, convince myself that there's some something like that going on but I, I, you know i couldn't argue so much about something like that either it's hard to say i have to wait for it all all that to be processed by the seismologists and um um, go from there, right? And then I still consider this to be separate, like I keep saying, right? But eh, maybe, maybe the dip's got something to do with it. 
it's a possibility there. All right, so um, what have I got next here? I believe I got, got to go. Now let's look at this here. So this is the, the rest of that 81 sequence by Carpet and Thurber from 87. And, and they're actually looking from A prime to A now. So this is north. And that would be south. So in this case, the dike was actually earlier. Earthquakes were in an area that was smaller and then it propagated further over within six hours later, then six hours later. So they could see the actual progression of this, of this opening um, to the north, which is not what we see uh, today. So part of this may have to do with this whole structure tectonics here, and this is all from Judson et al. 2018. Um, once again, um, JVGR, and they're showing a strike slip major component here. Let me come in on this, right? They're showing that there's essentially a north-south structure that exists out of the summit here and before it bends to the southwest rift. That there's a junction there that perhaps it's at this junction of faults that you have this buildup and activity, right? That, that may be causing some of that pressure and, you know, um, injection into other, other, other structures around here, right? But the idea essentially is that this is all south flank here and here. So it all moves this way. So if you're on this side, you would watch it move to your left. If you're on this side, you would watch it move to your right. But it's all the same essential motion like that, right? And because of that, that structure head of the south flank here, um, this is why this area is very seismically active. It quite often rubs and generates earthquakes, regardless of what else is going on around. Right? So there have, we have several elements going on, and this is the last one I wanted, wanted to bring in on that aspect of essentially possibly why there is the structure itself may have something to do with it there. Right? Okay, so let me come back to, I gotta come back to tweet here, and we're gonna dig another layer off of it here. And Dr. Clifford Thurber also says it is also possible that offsets due to bias in the earthquake locations due to 3D structure. So 3D structure is something that we haven't talked about before, but I think, I think I'll jump into it briefly here um, by showing um, Dr. Thurber's um, models that were published in professional paper 1350 in 1987 as well. So here is that 1987 um, publication of the, of the 81 data once again. So here's that whole of 81 Southwest Rift Zone sequence. South flank is active as well. We also have Kawiki and Mauna Loa. That's a whole other story for another day. But it includes all that, right? So we're going to zoom into this little, little rectangle right over there to look at the patterns of what they've uncovered as mapped as, as a velocity um, variations. And so that's that same rectangle. And we have four different slices, Z being the depth slice through one kilometer down, I'm sorry, a minus one kilometer, that's essentially near the surface. Five kilometers down, two kilometers down, eight kilometers down. And the idea being that there's a, there's a variability, right? It gets deeper with depth across the board. Um, but even in areas uh, along among the same depth, you can have 30% variation, 40% variation in, in, in the, the travel speed of the earthquake waves here um, within a very short area side to side, right? So depending on what model you use and how quick the earthquake is going to go through this particular piece of rock, then it, it affects how all the rest of your data prop propagates through all the rest of your data. So the, the velocity model is an important thing. This is an old one, but I thought it would be good enough for an example and showing diff different layers of how it works. And we, we see trace, trace through here the southwest rift zone, right? Showing how there is even along the rift zone, um, a progression of different velocities that the seismic waves travel along right there, right? And so, uh, zoomed into the summit at a depth of zero kilometers, one kilometer, two kilometers here. You can see, you know, um, you do have essentially like little, little low velocity pits where it's slower and then faster zones and slower zones once again. So at one to two kilometers depth, this is in the area we're talking about. So it matters all through there, right? This is, this is why, why it matters as far as the relocations and all that, right? So, um, Let's look at that in 3D. Here's the cross section looking through that. So you see the caldera area being more or less in here with earthquakes plotted on there, depth 0, 4, 8. You can see the contour lines of velocity of 3 meters per second, 4, 
five. You can see where they split around the presumed magma area there, and possibly in a rift zone as well. Right? Possibly in a rift zone as well. Um, but overall, you see that that uh, uh, increase going deeper, but variations laterally quite a bit, right? You see it goes up and down and up and right. So there's quite a bit of variation you can measure on a surface on that as well. So and that affects how you how you plot things out. Why does this all matter? Um, here's one example of, of different models, 1D model versus 3D model data points around a summit. And you can see certain areas here, all the open squares are all getting replotted systematically further to the southwest. Right? This is just one one model. This is not how the USGS may be doing their catalog at all, in fact. you know, But it's just one example of how this actually works. In one, one quadrant, they're going this way. In this 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 quadrant, they're pretty close, but maybe going that way. So, you know, everything varies depending on the model that's being used, and it might be off a little bit here and there. And it might adjust certain areas a little bit this way or that way, depending on what the structure is. And it is possible that you may have some bias systematically pushing your locations further east than they actually belong. So that was a long way to say all that, you know, but that, that comes back to, to the, uh, the answer there. Of what Dr. Thurber is saying, it's possible the offset is due to the bias in earthquake loca loca locations due to the 3D structure, right? That's to unpack it for everyone else who's not a seismologist here, uh, familiar with USGS here. And so I'll we'll leave it with that. I'll, I'm not, not going to go into the any further into the the um, conversation there. You can, guys can go find that. Um, I will end with one thing here. I know I've been going for a while, but I will end with a teaser of what might be to come in the future. I talked about possibly looking at the 70s in 1974. I have here just a period of 1974 to 76 when a lot, a lot, a lot was going on uh, on island, right? So um, during this time, maybe I'll try to play it and see if I can keep up here, right? You see activity in the Kauiki area between Mauna Loa. You see activity in the summit and Upper East Rift. Southwest Rift Eruption. South flank movement, Kawiki earthquake, southwest rift zone intrusion, um, summit eruption of Mauna Loa occurring here. There, there's a follow up of the summit eruption of Mauna Loa. Uh, you can get a big south flank earthquake at Kalapana. Whole south flank moves. Southwest rift zone gets another intrusion coming back in through here. So, all in all, I wanted to, to not exclude anything and give you guys the whole big picture and just go to show how complicated things actually can get, right? And so, and in a grand scheme of things, having a little activity, a little bit of the ways into the Southwest Rift is really nothing compared to there is no Mauna Loa going on, there is no giant South Flank earthquake going on, there is no uh, all this, all this other stuff going on as well, right? So it's interesting how all how it all fits together, and perhaps when we look at the seventy four eruption, here's my teaser. That occurs here, right? This gives us this gives us a little window into the tectonic context, all the forces at play during this era in time, which perhaps force an unusual eccentric eruption like seventy four to actually happen. Where that's one of the only times we've seen lava come up under under that from that se seismic southwest rift zone area, the southwest rift connector area, instead of that further north area of the volcanic southwest rift. So we'll. When we look at 74 in the future, right, that's a whole whole bunch of other detail and why we can't do it today. And that's enough for now. We can um, wrap it up and take some questions. Um, and that's our special feature for the week here, our historical look back um, through the 80s and peeking just br briefly into the 70s here a little bit of previous similar events on our volcano as far as seismicity and all that. Yeah, that 74 looks uh, much more complicated than what we're seeing now. Very similar around the summit, but wow, yeah, the south flank and Mauna Loa. Yeah, that's my caveat. Of, you know, I, I, I excluded other earthquakes, so it wouldn't be distracting for reason other periods of time. There's other things going on always, you know, um, this is just to reset our context of, you know, nothing exists in a vacuum, obviously. Right. We do have a $35 super chat from our friend Gary Bryant, who says, really appreciate your time and research prep and data resource gathering for these updates. Awesome Drones On series as well. Uh, appreciate it, Gary. Appreciate the support. We do have a couple questions here. Oh, and there is going to be another Drones On episode uh, premiering after this live stream. But we do have a couple questions here. Um, 
I think you kind of addressed this one just now, but mind readers ask, uh, where are the entry points for love? Or where is the, has basically the eruption happened at these points that we've seen uh, inflation at historically or these, uh, or at the locations of the earthquakes? Yeah, so let me click this button on this map that's running here and switch it to the satellite view. <laughs> Let me zoom in a little bit here. Because in the desert, there's no vegetation, and we can very clearly see these dark lines as being the eruption sites, right? So the 74 eruption site, let me pause this animation here. And pull it back to the 74 era. And so there's the earthquakes. It's this black lava flow right here is where the lava actually came out, right? It was there. That was the, the most recent eruption area from 74. The 71 on the upper southwest rift was over here. That's the two most recent deals on the southwest rift zone right there. Yeah, You see in 70, uh, uh, 74, earthquakes continue further past this because after eruption was over, seismicity continued beyond that and actually migrated further down, suggesting a further intrusion beyond the eruption in 74 as well. So that's one thing to... Another little teaser there, but it goes to show how things can really be drawn out even when multiple things are going on in the Southwest Rift intrusion area, right? And you know, maybe it takes Mauna Loa being, you know, um, inflating, flaring off Kawiki to that level to pinch off this this shallower area closed, right? So that nothing can actually actually uh, move through there, and instead it's forced up through a, a different weakness in the volcano. That's that's that'll be our paradigm to look at going forward there. All right. We have a question here from JW. Um, does the chemistry of each rift zone vary? And is there any differences in their behavior between the southwest rift and the east rift zone? So yeah, that's a great question. Um, the chemistry of every eruption varies and so the rift zones as well. And there are systematic differences, as, as which, which I believe is what you're actually getting at, right? And, and because the Southwest Rift has a lot less frequent uh, intrusions and um, activity, right, uh, geologically as well, we believe that, that there's that there's a, a more evolved magma in there, right? The magma's been sitting around stagnating for longer, so that means you could have slightly more andesitic compositions, perhaps, you know, slightly more of these... Fisher 17 from 2018 style eruptions with a big loud booming, um, you know, um, activating old magma pockets, that kind of thing um, could certainly be possible. When you look across the Southwest Rift and you see those big cones, they, they do look a lot like some of those lower East Rift zone cones from 2018. All right. Next question is from Ed. And he asks, uh, at this point with, you know, what we've seen and where we're basically at in the activity, how much, uh, how much of a buildup could we expect into the next eruption? Are we talking hours, days worth of earthquakes, weeks of activity? Um, you know, it it not you know, it's it's all about there being um, some kind of blockage that's been broken there, and so now the pathway is essentially open there, right? So that's that's really the thing is there could there could be not a whole lot of of huge change, right? You might see the GPS moving and the tilt, tilt moving and uh, detect the gases coming out and detect INSAR. But you, you know, you might, you would expect at least low levels of earthquakes, but you might not see huge amounts of earthquakes. Um, and you, you know, you might, you might not even get lava coming out of, out of the crack. It might, it might be very near the surface in a crack and not actually get out of the crack because there's so many cracks around there too. So that's, that's I don't know. It's interesting to think right. about. Um, it's hard to say, really right you know um if clearly if there's a big big resumption of the the tilt meter or the gps or we see this the, the earthquakes it'll be obvious that that something is coming right but you know um, generally that would be hours ahead of time you know um possibly days depending you know if you see you know on, on, on a signal depends how, how it comes out and where if it comes out nearby if it's going to go through that that rift zone for a while and then come out some distance away it might take a little longer right so a lot of possibilities and, and you know just just a discussion i don't have the answer there yeah good question though um yeah so and, next oh go ahead. 
Yeah, and I, I, I didn't mention this week's Volcano Watch here. You know, eruption or intrusion, what's the difference? You know, but they, they're basically uh, uh, <clears throat> talking about the, the INSAR and everything else as well. Um, and saying that essentially for now, it looks like it was just an intrusion, but you just got to wait and see also. This, this is the most recent um, writing we have from USGS on the topic, so I just want to make sure you mention what, what they're saying here as well, too, right? Um, they say the intrusion was a failed eruption. This time we observed an intrusion. And even though everyone was on high alert, in the end, that was all it was. And so we'll see. We'll see what else happens. I've, I've shown how some of these uh, uh, other sequences have drawn out for months after the fact with other later phases. So we'll have to wait and see. We have a question about the recent CAM uh, and its generalized positioning. Like, where is it uh, on the volcano? We could pull up a map. I did pull up the hvo map to see if they've marked it uh its exact location but they have not it's by the 1982 flow so it, it's it's uh they did say it was at sand hill right yes near sand hill south uh near sand hill by the 1982 flow right so sand hill is this location over here already right over there and so it's kind of south of this of this um, right hand bend on the road after it comes down a hill here and falls off in a crater. All right, so maybe I can, let's see, I got my Google Earth here. If we can zoom in. Right, if there is a bend in the road right in there. So Sand Hill is down in this area somewhere in here. I can see relative to the earthquakes where it actually is. Let's see if I can get the camera up again. Where did I leave it? Oh, I got so many different slides here. There it is. So live image of the 82 outlet flow from the Sand Hill area. Let's see. The foreground is Sand Hill and background shows north facing faults. This temporary view covers the area of August 2020 seismicity is looking south. So it's covering area seismicity and looking south. So, so perhaps it's more over here. Right? Looking this way. Might be my guess, right? Maybe, maybe over here-ish. Right. If I'm gonna Somewhere bring, in there. If I'm gonna bring all that stuff in, I know I can use a road. Right, I might not want to go past this big crack because right, it starts dropping off. But could easily somewhere over here. Right, and that perspective, if we were to let's see if we can leverage Google Earth here. Let's turn this thing around. And yeah, that would, that would be the view. I don't know if I can get it to. Yeah, oops, that's the wrong button, I think. User error here. What's the one I want? This one. Yeah, there we go. Right, so that's my guess, right? So you can't really see the deep hole of the caldera. And that would be off screen to the left over here. And so here's that bend in the road. I guess somewhere in here, the other, you see that there are other roads that come around. And so the other instrument sites are, there are other in instrument sites over in this area as well. So I mean, it could be up here, but if they're saying it's looking more to the south, across the seismicity, then maybe it's more over here somewhere and it's looking, looking back over there. So let's see if we can pick anything out here from this view. I mean, if there is that, that, that area of, of Looks like different kind of tephra here in the foreground and the background. You can see the lava flow in the back. Yeah, it's hard to tell exactly. It looks like this might be yeah. the edge of a flow right there. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, somewhere in there though. Not That's sure. the general area looking south. Yeah, this could be the edge of the flow. I'm not sure there. Exactly, but something like that. 
definitely definitely a cool little camera that they added. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And they kind of do that whenever there's activity in an area. Something might be of interest. Might as well go put up a cam for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fantastic. All we right, well, used to have to hike out everywhere to get, get any, any kind of view of what was going on. And hike out and wait till dark and see if it's red. That's the way of doing things. The new way of doing things is webcam is much better. Yeah, definitely. Thermal cameras as well. Yeah. Uh, last question here for this episode. Uh, Doug asks... What? How do you make more green sand beaches? Well, more of them. I don't know. <laughs> how you make them in general is you have to have a lot of olivine in your lava flow, and so right. certain eruptions um, will tap pockets of magma that have more olivine in them. Um, that maybe that's as far enough as far as you need to take it, right? So, like you know, where the famous green sand beaches that flow is, is next to the ocean, and erosion of that of that material produces a lot of olivine pieces which are making up the green sand yeah so you have to yeah, have long process you have to have more olivine rich magma at the surface come up right and so it's just it, you know it, because you have a, have a variation in chemistry it's not like every, everyone is like that it's one here one there and th that's where you get your green sand beaches or you get your you know th there's green sand kind of everywhere right all the lava's got green sand in it green sand grains right you can go to the white sand beaches on the kohala coast and you can find green sand olivine crystals in the sand in the white chunks of black and chunks of white for the coral right but um, um to have it be mostly green without the coral you also talking about having an area that doesn't have a reef and you know um, is mostly that flow without without the black rock around and that's why green sand beach has a combination of all those things all right well that'll do it for this episode we are going to premiere uh, another episode of drones on going to be covering june 12th to 15th the 2018 kilaway eruption we're going to talk about a little bit the homes loss map and its usage by the governor of hawaii and then the department of defense and fema so yeah, join that one. Uh, it'll only be, I think it's 10 minutes, this one. So yeah, check it out. It'll premiere immediately after this live stream. Right on. Look forward to that. And Dane's being modest, right? Dane was heavily involved in that home was lost map. You know, it was, it was, it was he who was the lead on getting that, that data gathered so that there was data in the first place that wasn't included by someone else. So mahalo Dane once again for all that. And we'll look, I'll look forward to, to watching that drones on. So uh, for Dane DuPont, your Hawaii tracker, I'm Philip Ong. See you guys next week unless something else happens in between now and then.